Now we've got Max Free, and she's going to uh, tell you about the choir that couldn't sing. I don't want to give away any more of Max's surprises tonight, but you're in for a real treat, I can tell you that. So I'm going to relinquish the storyteller chair. And mm -hmm. come over here. Hand over the step. Yeah, I'll pass the step. I should say a little bit about Max. I want to say a little bit about Max. She has a fascinating background. She's been a publisher, and I think she's traveled a fair amount, and I've only begun to learn some of the special things about her. I mean, sometimes we just see her up there singing in the choir, but so much more. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read you a story that my husband wrote. He, uh, when, after he retired from publishing and public television, he took up writing religious humor. Uh, this is his second book of short stories. This one is it's the title story of the choir that couldn't sing. Uh, I could join that one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I don't think any of you knew about I didn't. Well, you, but you certainly all saw him, because mm -hmm. he was in the choir singing bass for nine years, mm -hmm. and we lost him six years ago this week. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, this is particularly appropriate, I think, given our commitment to the Clark School and the grandchildren. It all started with one little boy. Then a bunch of folks got together to help him. They were all to be charitable about it a bit off-center, and not one could carry a tune. There was no musical talent in any of their bones. Not a lick. Not a. When they tried to sing, it was a disaster. It wasn't just that they sang off-key. They sang in no recognizable key whatsoever. Each warbled off in his or her own tone-deaf way, so they sounded just off. But they were a choir. A different sort of choir, a choir that couldn't and normally didn't sing. Their lack of musical talent didn't really matter very much, but how they came to be and what they did and how they influenced a whole bunch of other people is something of a tale. In their aggregate, they were an uncommon group of folks who were pretty much out of the mainstream of American life. Some were physically off-putting, some had their own agenda that did not coincide with the ones favored by their fellow church members, and some were just seriously weird. <laughs> <laughs> not that they were dumb, at least most of them, or particularly inept, at least most of them, or even truly eccentric, at least most of them. <laughs> but they were a bunch of folks who were simply a bit unhinged. One repeatedly stumbled over his own feet, Another list that spewed saliva over people when he got excited. One lady had an unpronounceable name. Another one was so slow that she needed a recipe to make ice cubes. <laughs> they were an all wondrous bunch, looked upon by their fellow church members as people who resided somewhere beyond the circle of normalcy. But their actions were enough to start at small campfires of spiritual hope for a lot of other folks. It wasn't that the suburban church they belonged to didn't have any choir. This was not one of those churches where anyone who could see their breath in a mirror was a member of the choir. <laughs> On the contrary, the music program of the Grace United Methodist Church and its chancel choir was the envy of all the neighboring churches. The 30 voice aggregation boasted many public school music teachers and was led by an assistant professor of music from a nearby college. Uh, many were all fine instrumentalists, and as a result, loop doop duets, a harp, and even string quartets were heard occasionally during worship service. The organist was especially accomplished and could fake anything. He was particularly adept at providing background music during communion services, a skill he had picked up while playing for the many Saturday morning masses at a Catholic church while walking his way, working his way through college. <clears throat> His noodling sounded sacred, but was simply chords strung together an impromptu sort of sonata. Mm -hmm. He always timed the music to the movement of the communion servers 
and there pass the bread and grape juice through the congregation for ambulations. He often had to draw out a final chord resolution for more than two minutes while waiting for one of the slower ushers to return to the pulpit area with his tray of the little glasses. And the organist was most capable of covering up his mistakes. On the occasions <laughs> when his fingers failed to hit the right notes and eyebrows were raised, he called it alternative harmonization. <laughs> <laughs> he and the director even had an outreach program. There was the Cherub Choir, made up of the younger school kids, and the Wesleyan Choir that had eight teenage girls and three boys. They were both led by music teachers in the chancel choir, and they sent one of their teachers to the nearby Golden Age Siesta on a weekly basis to lead a makeshift choir there that was constantly being depleted by people passing away. It was by such a ministry that the Grace United Music Program and its chancel choir made a joyful noise unto the Lord. They followed John Wesley's admonition to burst into jubilant song with music. And Psalm 84, 4, which directed the faithful to rejoice and sing praise. And the church membership kept increasing slowly, in part because of the strong music program. So the proposed to authorize yet another choir was met with considerable concern by members of the board. Weren't their choirs enough, they asked? Wouldn't they be diluting their success? Besides, which people were going to be in it? The proposal had been offered by the new associate pastor. Although he was fresh out of seminary and eager to make his mark on his first calling, he recognized that the proposed membership of the new choir posed something of a problem. He had canvassed the congregation and compiled a list of potential members for the new choir, and it was, some said, a doozy. There was one happy lady who was known <clears throat> excuse me, by the kids in the church as Fat Granny Fat. <laughs> Her Christian name was Fanny Armbruster, and she was the widow of Clayton Armbruster, who had been the janitor of the church for many years. She was also the grandmother of a castle of kids, one of whom was deaf. Kids whispered that her first name was truly appropriate, for the gray-haired lady had an enormous rear end. <laughs> It stuck out sideways and backways and every which ways like it had a life of its own, like it wasn't attached to it, but of course it was. In their adolescent disdain for anyone who wasn't cool, some of the kids in the Methodist Youth Fellowship, that's MYF, poked fun at her behind her back. One of them snickered that she could probably provide all the shade they needed for their annual picnic in the park. The same smart alecky kid whispered that she probably needed backup lights. Fanny had another distinguishing characteristic. Enormous feet. Feet so huge that they rivaled the fake ones seen on the clowns of the circus. Her humongous pedals and rear end made her amble along in a rolling gait that resembled a sailor navigating the deck of a ship in a storm. Blessedly, she never heard any of the cruel remarks. Because she was so kind and gentle, the adults of the church loved her. The congregation's sole ethnic member had also signed up for the new choir. Her name was Natasha. Mat Natasha Slyuanovsky, a Serbian lady whose English was somewhat shaky. She came from a Yugoslavian family whose members were very proud of their brilliantly colored clothes and potato dumplings. People in the little enclave that she came from in the nearby city all had difficult to pronounce names, and their first language was one that no one had ever heard of. Its alphabet was backwards. <laughs> Only the church secretary could spell Natasha's last name correctly, and few members could really pronounce it. What had motivated the lady to join Grace United was unclear. She had merely shown up one Sunday morning and kept coming back. Eventually, she became a member. It was probably her attempt to become more American, to be assimilated. By joining a church in the suburbs, she could get out from under the cloud of ethnicity that marked her as an immigrant. Maybe she hoped it would cure her differentness and sense of isolation from the American way of life. 
Like many folks who seek membership in a church, however, Natasha's reasons were a wonderful tangle of complexity with no tidy explanation. Faith, a need to belong, and certainly hope all played a part. And the people of Grace United welcomed her warmly, even though they didn't understand her. For she occasionally got her mix talked up. At the reception for new members, she thanked the minister from the heart of my bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha's bottom, battle with the English language was in contrast to Harry the Hummer's love of it. He was one of the two guys who had signed up for the new choir, and he was, by common agreement, a character. Harry was on the library committee and had the disturbing habit of tapping his pencil on the table whenever he talked at meetings. And when he put away the books that had been returned each week, he accompanied the task with a constant humming. World War II songs, mostly. It was a bit unnerving. Harry was a little bow-legged fellow who liked to joke that he was so old he had some body parts they didn't even make anymore. <laughs> his hair was white, as his wife's would have been had she allowed nature to take its course. He was known for his perpetually bad haircuts and she for her perpetually bad hair days. The dotty old guy had three major passions in life, nature, toy soldiers, and the English language. He loved to spend time in the nearby woods engaging in what he called power bird watching. <laughs> and he was fond of going on walks with a local chapter of the Audubon Society. He tried to combine two of his hobbies, by taking along a crossword puzzle and a pencil on nature hikes. But he was forced to abandon the idea when he kept ricocheting off trees because he was so absorbed in his puzzle. <laughs> Thank the good Lord he had an understanding spouse. She tolerated, even encouraged, his infatuation with his toy soldiers. He could spend hours with his collection. At least I know where he's at, she said with a smile as she sat knitting in the corner. Most of Harry's time was spent at his typewriter. He had occupied nearly three hours every day for the last five years in a little room at the back of his house, writing an epic novel about universal sin. He told those who inquired that he was against sin because he was against anything he was too old to enjoy. <laughs> the manuscript, however, was now more than 1,439 pages uh -huh. long, and he had been struggling for nearly 400 pages to find a finish for it, but it just kept going, world without end. He was, he admitted, in a fog of words. Harry had a buddy, Anthony, Murray, where did I get Anthony? Mm -hmm. Murray had also signed up for the new choir. The two got along well because Murray was also short and had an equally childlike hobby. He had a passion for model airplanes, building them, that is. It had been a part of him since his boyhood days. Some people thought maybe it was the glue. <laughs> <laughs> but the 40-ish little guy was a secret abuser of stimulants. At least he thought his indulgence was secret. He had been a member of the church for more than 10 years, and a lot of folks loved him and thought they had him figured out. Murray was a Vietnam vet whose face had a perpetual look of sadness about it. It was like everything in life was just pretty much too much. In truth, his demeanor was a part of and the result of his occupation because Murray made and sold pet caskets. It was his profession. He had just sort of drifted into it. After his discharge, he spent two years in a bathroom watching television. Eventually, he hung around the streets in the nearby city and did odd jobs and acquired a mongrel dog that became his best friend. When the animal died, Murray put him in a cardboard box and buried him in an empty lot, but it bugged him. With all the love animals give and get, he thought they deserved to be disposed of in style. So he began to investigate and learned that regular caskets were too big for most pets, unless you were talking about horses or elephants. <laughs> Those had to be made up specially, of course. So he set about learning how to make coffins for dogs and cats and birds. He decided to go for the high end of the market. Instead of caskets lined with paper, he opted to line the small boxes with satin 
and provide silk pillows and even little cashmere blankets. And he was successful, so much so that he expanded into wooden urns for those who wanted cremation instead of burial for their dead companions. He chose wood because it was, he said, pretty much God's material. He used it instead of pottery for his urns because he could paste a picture of the deceased on it, or sometimes carve a cross or a star of David if the mourner wanted it. It did beg the question, though, of how one could tell if one's parent was Jewish. <laughs> there was some satisfaction in the work. He took occasional comfort in the fact that one of his urns with a rover in it was probably right up there with old Uncle Henry on somebody's mantle. <laughs> But overall, his job was depressing, for he had to deal with the wailings and breastfeedings of the bereaved. So he was prone to retreat on many nights to his lonely apartment and indulge in his model airplane building and the consolations of a substance or two. But his fellow church members loved him and ignored his problem, even though they didn't know what substance he might have been abusing. He threw a lot of smiles at the coffee hour after as folks kept trying to cheer him up. Nadine Bodine also signed up for the new choir. She was a caution, for she was just a bit slow. The members of Grace United, however, had welcomed her into the fold, even though, some said, she was a few chips shy of a full bag of treatments. <laughs> she once lost her glasses and cried buckets because she said she couldn't look for them until she found them. And she had been in counseling for many years with a variety of psychologists. But it seemed to her they were asking her to forget what she could not remember. Lately, she began to think that if one day she found herself, she'd probably be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so Nadine went about with that bacon, did I believe the oven on look on her face? And though some of the church ladies rolled their eyes about her, they warmly accepted her with Christian love. The last one to put her name on the associate pastor's sign-up sheet for the new choir was loquacious Chloe Burke. Her hobby was gardening, and she often provided the flowers on the altar for the Sunday services. She was particularly taken with a variety she called Pardalianthes, which she said was Latin for, has the power to strangle a leopard. <laughs> <laughs> no one on the flower committee had ever challenged that. <laughs> Probably good reason. Chloe talked a lot, mostly to herself. Her constant murmurings were as disconcerting as Harry's humming and often taxed the patience of her fellow committee members. Her mutterings made it harder for those around her to concentrate on the important church business at hand. Chloe's life had been largely incident by, influenced by accidents. She had met her husband, Paul, by mistake. He had meant to call another girl who got the numbers <laughs> mixed up. And on one occasion, after they were married, he had lost her in a big Kmart and had spent an hour wandering the aisles whispering, Chloe, Chloe. <laughs> she had been in the ladies' room for most of that time. <laughs> Chloe had initially been a bit reluctant to join the new choir. How much time would it take, she asked. Would I have to come to every rehearsal or performance? <laughs> for she was wont to go to foreign lands sometimes to winter wonderlands, particularly in the summer. And she loved to recall her trips in some detail to herself. But there was something unusual about her travels. They all took place in her mind. Would become a, a member of the new choir hamper her travel without leaving home, Bobby, she asked. But her decision to sign up was really made for her. Over the years, Chloe had developed a bit of a hearing problem and her husband, Paul, didn't speak very clearly. The result was that lately they had been having some problems communicating. The double handicap had resulted in some odd dialogue. He, did you hear we're going to have more snow tonight? She, no, he won't win. <laughs> and one day she told the associate pastor that she liked his reference in the sermon to the parable about the multitude that loafs and fishes. Her husband was like that, she said. <laughs> and the same time now, she had been singing Where the Deer and the Cantaloupe Play to the refrain of Home on the Rain. A kind of member had recently pointed out her error at the monthly meeting of one of the church circles. 
so her difficulty in hearing made her very sympathetic to the new choir project. She thought perhaps she might eventually go deaf. Learning sign language might help in the future. It was a hedge against the possible. For the signing was to be the mission of the new choir. They were going to be the silent choir, communicating mostly through the use of American Sign Language, known universally as ASL. The idea had started when the new associate pastor noticed a little lad of about eight in a pew with his mother. He had seen them there for two straight Sundays. The child spent most of the service staring straight ahead or down at the floor with a rather blank look on his face. As the congregation filed out after the service, the associate pastor intercepted the two of them at the shaking of hands ritual at the church doors and discovered that although the mother had normal hearing, the boy was deaf. Peter was his name, and he was a good-looking little guy who attended the nearby Mill Pond School for the Deaf. It was a private school for grades one through nine, financed by public funds. Peter and his family were new to the area. So a pastor insisted that the two of them come to the coffee hour, and there he introduced him to his wife, who immediately engaged the boy in conversation using sign language. She was a graduate of the University of Iowa, and had chosen to take ASL to satisfy her foreign language requirement. The U of I was one of the few major universities at that time to count two years of study of the system of hand <coughs> gestures and facial expressions as foreign language credit. And she had discovered that ASL is a visual language of the heart. It has a fluid grace with small as well as broad patterns of lyrical body language and expressive facial movements, like the lovely Hula Hand song of Hawaiian dancers. The rich movements in their aggregate can tell a story. While there is a great deal of controversy within the deaf community about ASL, Sign has since become the way in which most of the deaf in America communicate with themselves and with the hearing world. The, son, the young associate pastor's wife had enjoyed her opportunity to brush up on her old college signing skills at the coffee hour with Peter and his mom. And the next week she sat next to them and interpreted a sermon and scripture reading for the lad, for his mother knew only a few signs. But the associate pastor's wife sensed that something was missing. It was the congregation's group singing of the hymns and the singing of the anthem by the 30-voice choir. Her lone voice of interpretation wasn't adequate to the sight and feeling of a community of people singing the praises of the Lord. So she persuaded her young husband to propose the establishment of a silent choir. They would sign some hymns, and perhaps the anthem sung by the chancel choir if they got good enough. She said she'd join, and maybe he could get some more folks to be a part of it. As he went around collecting signatures on his sign-up sheet, the associate pastor had become energized by the possibility. The board, however, didn't share his enthusiasm. Who's going to lead this thing, they asked. Will it cost money? All this for just one kid? Why can't your wife just continue on and interpret the anthem and the hymns for you? And anyhow, for heaven's sakes, who's going to be in this choir? And as they studied the list of names the associate pastor had collected, they grew silent. With the exception of his wife, the group that had signed up, while well, nice enough, were all a bit, well, strange. <laughs> and the jury was still out on her. There are only seven names on here, somebody said. Maybe we'll get more once the thing gets rolling, said the associate pastor. Besides, we don't need a whole lot of people. As for the money, it won't cost the church a dime, he added. They were working on a teacher at the school that Peter attended, a Miss Penelope Oxford, who was raised a Methodist, to come over and teach the group sign language and lead them in the signing. They would only perform once a month, to begin with, he said, but maybe they could do it more often as the choir got more experience to learn more of the language. As for the, why can't your wife just continue on and interpret the anthem and the hymns for him? The associate pastor used a quote from the famous choral director Robert Shaw, who had once noted that the choral experience 
forces you to conclude that you can do something finer together than you can do yourself. And the associate pastor added, there is glory in numbers. His final argument for the establishment of the choir was that it was a great opportunity for outreach. There were about 24 million Americans, 11% of the population, who were deaf or hearing impaired, and some estimate that less than 10% of them go to church. That number was sure to grow, for when the baby boomers reach 65, when one in three people begin experience hearing loss, there will be a lot more. Grace United can begin to reach out now to these people, many of whom are unchurched, he said. Even if they never learn sign language, they can begin to appreciate the beauty of it and the problems of those with silence or near silence in their ears. The last argument hit two of the members of the board where it hurt. They were in their 60s. And it also persuaded another member who was looking for a new business now that his vacuum cleaner shop had gone back. Maybe hearing aids, he thought. <laughs> the young associate pastor's wife also submitted a statement that described what the new choir would be doing. She began with a quote from Keats. Heard melodies are sweet, but unheard melodies are sweeter. And she continued, we shall sign of the great glory of God. We shall sign of the joy of Christ. We shall sign of the summers and the winters of the earth and the promise of salvation. And quoting from Corinthians, she said that we will sing with the spirit and with the understanding also. It took an elderly lady on the board, however, to put the whole matter in a biblical perspective. Reminded by and quoting again from 1 Corinthians 13, she said wisely, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tickling cymbal. And having no desire to be seen as those loud instruments, the board approved the associate pastor's proposal for the establishment of the silent choir of the Grace United Methodist Church. And sure enough, two other folk joined up immediately after the board's approval. I think we'll stop here. And we'll find out next week how the choir developed. Interesting. Bob was quite interested in the hard of hearing and one of, one of his pursuits. We saw a show on Broadway when Marty Martin was first burst on the entertainment scene that, uh, that impressed us. Um, we used to have little arguments of which would be worse, being deaf or being blind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he thoroughly enjoyed writing. He's very good at character stuff. Mm -hmm. he, 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 a, he, a little bit far out, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not so sure. Me neither. Was he a Methodist? He Did was. He Methodist? was raised Methodist. Oh, okay. But, um, well, and after we were married, we attended whichever Methodist or Presbyterian church where we liked the minister and the music. <laughs> um, our kids were raised most, mostly Methodist. Uh, and we were, we were married in the Congregational Church, so we consider ourselves kind of ecumenical. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about you, but this story, there's part two coming, of course. But it made me, sorry I didn't know Max, but glad to learn him in this way, sort of. Mm -hmm. But um, when Max agreed to be a storyteller, we've both been storytellers at Vacation Bible School, so I know she could tell a story. We might even be able to get her to teach us some of the stuff she taught the kids about some uh, a Hawaiian song, I think. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, she's, she's, I don't I, like I to be I the day after remember, her. I can't she remember said. the circumstances. Uh, I remember we, we had to do something about fish. And so I said, well, I can tell you about a Hawaiian fish. It must have been the fishes in the lives. Day. No, I don't think so. No, because you had a different day. Yeah. Well, anyway, she taught them a song, and I thought, gee, I can hardly get them to sit still. Mm -hmm. So I knew she'd be a great storyteller, but I, I must confess that when she said, you know, I, I kind of need some extra time, and I want to read a story that my husband wrote. Okay, I confess, I'm like, okay. 
because who knows? You know, <laughs> I mean, who knows? And um, but I, you know, I figured she knew a good story, so I went with it, and she sent me the story to read. And I, when I finished it, I honestly went immediately to my computer and rhapsodized over it. And finally, as I'm getting, you know, halfway through the email, I thought, okay, well, I'm going on and on, so I'm going to stop here. But um, anyway, part two is also good. So um, one other thing you asked was he a Methodist? You, we ended up in a Presbyterian church in New York for 25 years. And mm -hmm. while he was there, he wrote a, a book on how to survive being a Presbyterian. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, we, we had I hope a, we're going to share we, that with We us. had yeah. a book signing here shortly after. We, it wasn't published until after we got here. No, well, just before. When we had to decide on what church we were going to, we knew it had to be Presbyterian because you had to talk. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And, um, there were, there, we had a book signing and uh, sold some, and we had some left over, so we they were in the library. If you're interested, I think oh, cool. Dora said she had eight or ten copies. Of it. <laughs> and it, it's it's had it's it's some fun stuff. Well, thank you. How are we doing on time? I don't think so. What time is it, somebody? 7.15. I read faster than I expected. 15 minutes. Well, I was doing my speech.